Hello, I am back, and this is um, the second part of the um, video where I am discussing the restoration of the Gospel of Jesus Christ pamphlet uh, from the LDS Mormon Church, which was given to me by the Mormon missionary that I meet every week, right? And um, I've discussed the first part of it. Obviously, I need to I need to kind of like go faster with this because it's a lot of material kind of and I don't want to go too long like last time I went too long so I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible but I want you to get the gist of what the Mormons have to say right because this, this is ultimately a discussion on Mormon, of Mormon theology and it's very important because um, the restorationism restorationism you know the Mormons are a restorationist movement the other one is of course the Bible students with Charles Taze Russell so it's the Bible students with Charles Taze Russell and um, the Mormons. Those are the two legitimate uh, representatives of, of North American restorationism. So, um, and uh, it is they who I follow. In terms, of, I am post-Christian, but I am still committed to the theology of uh, restorationism. And uh, I consider that the Bible students, not the North American Bible students, not the European ones. The European ones have a different history. And, and this was pointed out to me by the Belgian Bible students. That's a separate thing. The European Bible students are a separate thing. Uh, I'm talking about the North American Bible students. And specifically, I follow the work of the Ohio Bible students. And I'm going to put a link in the description to their website. There is a general um, Bible students, uh, international Bible students, students website, and I'll link to them too. But the specific school of Bible students that I follow, specifically their eschatology, that I'm interested in following is the Ohio Bible students. And I will put a link in, there, in the description box to them. But physically, mainly, I am now uh, a fellow traveler of the LDS Mormon Church. Uh, at this point in history, I am a fellow traveler of the LDS Mormon Church. And I simply go to their congregation. You know, I, I partake in the sacrament. They said it was okay, even though I'm not a baptized member. It's okay to partake in the sacrament, uh, which is their version of the Eucharist. And I do that. I've done that for the past three Sundays, and it's fine. You know, I attend. I am allow, allowed to attend their Bible, their um, not Bible school, their, their Sunday school after the meeting. You know, and and that's fine. And, you know, and and they gave me the book. You know, they gave me the book, the curriculum book. You know, for the by the Bible school. You know, it's in Swedish, but you know. Um, and it's a curriculum book that you know every every week they have a different educational program for the rest of the year 2022 so every Sunday all I have to do is read this and I'm prepared for the Sunday school after the meeting you know and uh, and yeah and so I can learn you it's a school it's a school like right? that's cool Sunday school has a curriculum they have a textbook so I'll be studying theology with the Mormons objectively speaking is the study of theology right so that's what's gonna happen plus I'm meeting with the missionaries once a month while I can and if I cannot meet them physically, I'll try to do it on Zoom. But I'm going to try my best under the circumstances to meet the missionaries once a week and to go to the Mormon church every Sunday. I'm going to try to really hard, you know. Um, yeah, but, um, you know, um, and if because of COVID-19, they, they, they shut down the churches again, I'll ask to see if they can send me the, the Zoom link and I join them by Zoom when I can, assuming I have Wi-Fi or whatever. I'll find a way. But... Anyways, I have the curriculum. I have the Book of Mormon. I have my little copy of the Book of Mormon in Spanish. I have the curriculum in Swedish. Swedish curriculum, the Spanish Book of Mormon, and English Plan of Salvation, and English uh, The Restoration of the Gospel. And I have my little um, Book of Mormon 21 Day Challenge thing in English. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trilingual here. I've gone trilingual with the Mormons, you know. But anyways, all right, let's go back to the thing because I need to quickly finish this. Um, yeah, uh, excuse me. Oh, I am in the middle of doing laundry. So that, that's the sound you hear in the back. I'm in the laundry room. But, uh, yeah, since I'm waiting for the laundry, I thought I might as well do this video. It, I like I like recording from down here. It's nice. It's kind of it's a noisy, but it's nice to record from here. Anyways, um, Jesus Christ established his church. From the time of the creation, the children of God looked forward to the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ. As he had promised, our Heavenly Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to earth over 2,000 years ago. 
Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. He established his church, taught his gospel, and performed many miracles. He chose 12 men to be his apostles, including Peter, James, and John. He taught them and gave them priest, priesthood authority to teach in his name and to perform sacred ordinances such as baptism. And I would add, of course, that the, the apostles also had the power to, like, you know, heal the sick, expel demons, revive, resurrect the dead, etc. You know? Um, I think uh, the tradition says that when Peter was debating Simon Magus, um, they both levitated and Simon, Simon Magus fell on the ground, but Peter stayed up or something like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a stupid tradition. I think that the whole Simon Magus thing is, is derogatory because Simon Magus was the Samaritan Messiah. See, and the Christians had an interest in, in belittling Simon Magus because he was probably the, the Samaritan Messiah and you know they wanted to impose Jesus as the only and true Messiah, right? But that's another. It's another. I'm not gonna get into the into the Simon Magus versus Peter versus Jesus thing here. It's, it's out of context, out of out of the scope of this. But yeah, it, that's another issue. Anyways, um, right. Uh, so the um, the apostles have the right to perform sacred ordinances such as baptism. All right, all right. When Jesus established his church, he received instructions from our heavenly Father. He then instructed his disciples. Jesus taught his followers that revelation from God was the rock on which he would build his church. Exactly. This is very interesting. Jesus taught his followers that revelation from God was the rock on which he was to build his church. Revelation from God, right? So revelation from God is the rock. Not Peter as a person, but revelation from God. That's how the Mormons see it. Interesting. Hmm? Uh at the end, so the whole issue of Catholic Apostolic Succession that the Pope inherits the power of Peter or whatever, as the, like whatever, what is it called? The, something about the Vicar of Christ, right? The Vicar of Christ, that the, he inherits Apostolic Succession because he sits on the same throne that Peter sat or what have you. Uh, the Mormons would disagree with that interpretation because for the Mormons, the revelation from God is the rock. And the revelation from God, of course, he can grant to whomever he wants. So, for example, he chose the boy Joseph Smith and revealed to him, etc., and sent angels to an angel to point to him out where the Book of Mormon was buried and what have you. Um, anyways, and in that Book of Mormon, it says that Jesus Christ visited the Americas, right? Which is, again, in this Book of Mormon, they have a little thing here, a picture of it. It's my favorite Mormon picture, you know, this painting. You know, Jesus visiting the Americas, right? Jesus visiting the, 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 I think it was the Nephites, they call them. You know, when I first saw the, like I said in the other video, when I first saw this picture, I thought he, they meant the Incas or whatever, that Jesus had visited the Incas, and it turns out it was not the Incas, it was uh, the Nephite civilization that Mormons claim existed in South America. So yeah, there is, you know, Jesus visiting. Um, it's interesting though, because my mother is South American. But anyways, that's another issue, oh, whatever. Um, right. Uh, uh, la, la, la. At the end of his life, Jesus Christ suffered and died for the sins of everyone who has lived or who will live on earth. Right. And um, the, the, the ransom sacrifice of Jesus from the Mormon perspective does not pay for original sin. Because in the Mormon Articles of Faith, it states that we are responsible for our own sins and we don't inherit sin from somebody else. So, in the Mormons do not believe in the doctrine of original sin, right? There is no original sin. We don't inherit anything from Adam, you know? Um, and then the Mormons believe that the reason Adam and Eve fell, the fall of Adam was necessary in order for Adam to experience, experience sin. And then as a result of experiencing sin, he would then experience repentance, which will lead to him being uh, redeemed. That's the position of the Mormons. So, the, the, the purpose of Adam... In, in, the, in, the, in the Mormon narrative of soteriology is completely different from that of uh, uh, Christian Christ Jehovah's Witnesses included. Um, and, I, and again, I like, I, I like that. I, I, I subscribe 100% to that aspect of Mormon teaching that, um, you know, I'm responsible for my own sins, not the sins of anybody else. And that's it. I, I'm not responsible for the so-called sins of Adam. I don't inherit any sin from Adam. I'm only responsible for my own sins that I've committed in my own life, right? Uh, 
And furthermore, I would add to that, I would combine that with what Charles D. Russell said, that when we die, we pay for our sins. Okay, perhaps, I don't know. But anyways, that or maybe that's contradictory if you say that Jesus, uh, I don't know, paid for, through his suffering, death and, death and resurrection, the Savior made it possible for us to be forgiven, right? Right, so he died for the sins of everyone who lives on earth and who will live. So Jesus' atonement on the, Jesus' uh, sacrifice pays for the sins that we've committed in our life, okay? Uh, as long as there is repentance, right? There has to be repentance. Um, and for Mormons, repentance is a very central aspect of the plan of salvation and of soteriology. And when I do a video covering the plan of salvation, I will talk about that. Um, but, um, right. Those who have faith in him repent and keep his commandments, receive forgiveness of sins, and are filled with peace and joy. That's what they say about accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Um, if you, you have to repent, keep his commandments, receive forgiveness of sins, and are filled with, and then you will be filled with peace and joy. That's what uh, uh, Mormons teach. Um, right. Uh, this aspect, the, the great apostasy, the great apostasy, this is interesting. The apostasy. Um, following the death of Jesus Christ, wicked people persecuted and killed many church members. Other church members drifted from the principles taught by Jesus Christ and his apostles. The apostles were killed and priesthood authority, including the keys to direct and to direct and receive revelation for the church, was taken from the earth. Because the church was no longer led by priesthood authority, error crept into church teachings. So that would explain the Council of Nicaea and Constantine taking over and, and dictating a Christian theology or what the, the official Christian theology of the the official quote end quote Christ, the, the official so called Christian theology of the um, state church of the Roman Empire, which is the Catholic Church, right? Um, yeah, because the church was no longer, and that church was no longer led by priesthood authority, meaning the apostles. That church was led by bishops who were uh, puppets of Constantine. So error crept into church teachings. Uh, Constantine was a pagan who, who, uh, because people are going to say, oh, look at this heretic denouncing Saint Constantine or whatever. Uh, Constantine baptized on his deathbed, okay? Constantine never got baptized uh, like uh, during his lifetime. He waited until he was on his deathbed to uh, to uh, baptize. So, if you want to denounce, denounce me as a heretic and what have you, keep in mind that Constantine was a pagan until the moment he was about to die. So, uh, whatever. Um, anyhow. Good people and much truth remained, but the gospel was, as established by Jesus Christ, was lost. Uh, the period is this period is called the Great Apostasy. So basically, from the I would say from the the Mormons believe that from the date the last of the apostles died to the day when uh, God and Jesus appeared to Joseph Smith, I suppose that whole period of several hundred, like you know, when you know, eighteen hundred, like. It was in the 19th century that Joseph Smith was alive. So I don't know, between the death of the last apostle and the 1800s, it's probably like, I don't know, 1600 years. God knows how, how long, a long, long time, right? Um, that period is called the Great Apostasy, right? And um, this apostasy resulted in the formation of many churches with conflicting teachings. So you had, for example, the Schism between Eastern Orthodoxy and, Catholic, and Western Catholicism. During this time, many men and women sought the truth, but they were unable to find it. Many good people believed in God and Jesus Christ and tried to understand and teach truth, but they did not have the full gospel or priesthood authority. I guess that would, you know, people like you know, Francis of Assisi or Savonarola maybe um, would fall into that category. Um, Good people who believed in God and Jesus Christ and tried to understand and teach truth, but they did not have the full gospel or priesthood authority. You know, so yeah, maybe, um, maybe the flagellants during the uh, time of the Black Death. I don't know. That's stretching it. That's stretching. There were a cult, but inter I don't know. 
As a result, each, gen each generation inherited a state of apostasy as people were influenced by what previous generations passed on, including changes in Christ's gospel. And changes in Christ's gospel, I mean, the, I mean the, again, the Bible, you know, there are four root codexes, you know, um, uh, you know, the, which are uh, similar but not identical, you know, and then there is out of those four codexes have arisen all sorts of versions of the Bible. You know, the, the Bible that they use in the Ethiopian Christian Church has a bunch of books that don't appear in the Lingua Vulgate or, or King James, you know. Um, you know, all sorts of things have been added and deleted from different versions of the Bible. That you don't know which, which Bible is the true Bible, you know. And that includes the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation, you know where they have altered the language and stuff and, and adapted it to their theology, you know, or the Johannes Grever, Johannes Grever version of the, of the New Testament, which was made with the help of spiritistic mediums. Not that I'm against, you know, spiritistic mediums. If, if you're a spiritist and you want to summon, you know, spirits or whatever, and you believe in that, you believe in the Padgett messages, for example, which is supposed to be the spiritistic Bible, the full on spiritistic Bible, go ahead. I respect your belief. You have the right to believe what you want according to article 18 of the Declaration of Human Rights, but you know, I'm just pointing out as an example of that. There, you know, the Bible is there, there is many versions and facsimiles of it out there. You know, so yeah, changes to Christ's gospel. That's actually an understatement. It's far. The reality is far worse than that. Um, that's why I appreciate. I appreciate the Holy Quran and the Book of Mormon because with the Holy Quran and the Book of Mormon. You solve that problem, which is inherent to the Bible, the problem of multiple versions and you know and, and, and whatever. You know, with the with the Holy Quran and the Book of Mormon, you don't have that problem. So I would say that the Holy Quran and the Book of Mormon are more reliable than the Bible. You know, that, that but that's my opinion. Opinion, and it, this is not the perspective of the Mormon Church, because the Mormon Church believes that the Bible and the Book of Mormon complement each other. Um, yeah, whatever. Anyways, excuse me. Some inspired people, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, recognized that practices and, and doctrines had been changed or lost. They tried to reform the churches to which they belonged. Without priesthood authority, however, Christ's gospel could not be returned to its original form. A restoration was needed. So yeah, this is interesting. So this is the critique. This is this is a uh, the the. The restorationist critique of the Reformation, in a nutshell, you know, uh, you know, I mean, they they claim Martin Luther and John Calvin were inspired people. Uh, I think that's going too far. Uh, hmm. You know, I, Martin Luther was an anti-Semite, you know, and, and a, a virulent anti-Semite, and he, you know, um, hmm, I don't know, and and you know, some things he said, like you know. He, his idea that, you know, well, salvation comes from faith alone, you know, the book of James, in the, you know, in James it says that, you know, uh, faith without works is dead, you know what I mean? So you need works too, but Luther said you don't. Anyways, in Calvin too, you know, that is, uh, you know, only faith and whatever. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that Martin Luther and John Calvin were inspired. I think that they meant well. They, met, I mean, obviously, they were correct in breaking with the Catholic Church, and they were correct in uh, leading others to break from the Catholic Church. I mean, without Luther, without Luther, and uh, well, Savonarola was a precursor of Luther. Savonarola is not that significant. He was sort of like a precursor of Luther, but without Luther, you wouldn't have had, you know, we would, yeah. You need Luther. Ultimately, you need the Reformation for the Restoration to happen, right? So, the Reformation was a precursor to the Restoration. Uh, the Restorationist movements of the 19th century. I mean, you need to have the Reformation, especially the Radical Reformation of the 1600s, you know. But then another criticism I have of Martin Luther and John Calvin is that they didn't go far enough. They, I mean, John Calvin accepted the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. He accepted that God is a trinity. He accepted uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus is God, which are false doctrines that did not exist in the first century congregation. You know, and John Calvin went ahead and, and, uh, and agreed to uh, follow the uh, Nacino Constantinopolitan Creed because he was afraid of being branded a heretic, right? He was afraid that 
if he if he uh, stood for the the the, the, obje- the true truth that you know God is not a trinity and that Jesus is not God, if he had taken up those positions, which were the which were the positions of, for example, Michael Servetus in the book *The Trinitatis Erroribus*, and Michael Servetus was burned in Geneva, and I think in 1553 for that, you know, uh, you know, uh, Michael Servetus was is the one that I, I look at, you know in terms of the Radical Reformation. Not so much Luther and Calvin, because Luther and Calvin capitulated to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed and, and, the, and the false the false theology that came out of Constantine. So, you know, John Calvin presents himself as some sort of fundamentalist Christian, what have you, of, of, you know, whatever. And he was following the theology of Constantine. You know, he subordinated himself to, uh, <laughs> to the Council of Nicaea. So, you know, he's, and this is the problem with evangelicals today. Evangelical, fundamentalist evangelicals today, they claim to be the true Christians. We are the true Christians. You know, and, they, and they denounce the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. They're not true Christians. We are. But they follow the theology of Constantine, you know? <laughs> so they're not, you know, they, they follow the same theology of Constantine that the Catholic Church follows. So, you know, they're the same as the Catholic Church ultimately in premises because they follow us in the, nice, the lies, the, the false teachings, the false theology coming out of the council of Nicaea and Constantinople you know Jesus is not Jesus is not God and God is not and God is not a trinity God is one and Jesus is 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 the messiah the son of God but not God himself you know Arius was right uh, Michael Servetus was right and and Charles Dez Russell was right so about that so yeah and there and you know they John Martin Luther and John Calvin they tried to reform the churches to which they belong right Okay, yeah, and why did they fail? Why why is the Lutheran Church today as corrupt as the Catholic Church or the Russian Orthodox Church or the Anglican Church? Because, again, they didn't really break fundamentally with the Nicene Constantinopolitan apostasy, you know? That's why. That's why ultimately a restoration is necessary in the 19th century. Why it is necessary, why, why you know, Joseph Smith rose up and later on Charles S. Russell because the Reformation failed, the Reformation lost its 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 its, its, its revolutionary appeal. In the 1600s, it, the Radical Reformation petered out. You know, after the end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648, 1618 to 1648, Thirty Years' War. After that, you know, the Radical Reformation petered out, and you know, by the 1700s, you know, the Reformation churches became institutionalized. They became as as bad as the Catholic Church. So. Yeah, so by the 19th century, obviously, a restoration was necessary, and it came out of the American, the North American Great Awakenings. So yeah, ultimately, Jesus visited the, maybe Jesus visited the Americas, as the Mormons say, for a reason, you know, because ultimately the restoration came out of North America, not Europe, you know, whatever. Um, hmm. A restoration was needed. Uh, you're, uh, okay. Uh, oh, and this is a quote. A quote in the pamphlet. An important quote from the pamphlet, in the from the Book of Mormon, Amos eight eleven and twelve. God knew there would be an apostasy. Through an Old Testament prophet, he said, "Behold, the days come that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a." of hearing the words of the Lord and people shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it right so that that describes the er, er, the, uh, era of the apostasy from the death of the last of the apostles through Constantine hijacking uh, Christianity and turning it into the into an arm of the Roman state um and then, of course, the Reformation, the attempt, you know, the Reformation, emergence of the Reformation, which broke the power of, of the Catholic Church, but, you know, it became corrupted after the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, and then, you know, the, the Reformation churches, like the Anglican Church and the Lutheran churches and what have you, became as corrupt as the Catholic Church. So, yeah. Right. And, that's, and the Mormons would say that's because the, none of those churches had priesthood authority, right? So maybe the Mormons are right. Maybe the Mormons are right. And, you know, and, and Joseph Smith was, you know, Joseph Smith, the boy Joseph Smith was contacted by God to, to start things up again. Maybe that, that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem with that idea. I don't have a problem with that at all. 
That's fine. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Look, at least Joseph Smith existed, you know. At least he existed. At least I know he existed, you know. Um, <laughs> that's not the case with, like, Adam and Noah, <laughs> you know. Uh, whatever. Anyhow, the restoration of the gospel in 1820, as he had done throughout history, our Father in heaven again chose a prophet to restore the gospel and the priesthood on the, to the earth. Uh, that sounds a lot, but, but I'm going to defer from making comparisons here, but right. Okay, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Because people are going to say, oh, but you deny that Jesus chose Joseph Rutherford as the slave in 1919, but you go ahead and say that God chose Joseph Smith in 1820. What's the difference? Well, yeah, what's the difference? Um, the difference is that the Mormon church respects human rights. That's the difference. Okay, including Article 18. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. um, that prophet's name was Joseph Smith. As a young man, Joseph was confused by the difference the differences among the many churches in his area and wanted to know which church was right. Knowing that he lacked wisdom, he followed the counsel found in the Bible. Quote, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. And that is in James 1, 5. Yeah, and I, yeah, okay, yeah, the Mormons, again, the Mormons believe in the Bible, right? The, Mor the Mormon church believes in the Bible, the LDS church, they believe in the Bible. It's just me who is saying I don't believe in the Bible, but in the Book of Mormon. The Mormons are going to say that's not right, you have to believe in the Bible too, but I, I refuse because I don't believe in the Bible, and I already explained why. Um, I'm sick and tired of the Bible, you know? Sick and tired of the Bible. I had enough of the Bible already. For the past eight years, I had enough. You know? I'm happy with the Book of Mormon um, and the Holy Quran on the side if I need to look up something. Up. Uh, anyhow, Joseph Smith decided to ask God what he should do. When Joseph prayed to know the truth, our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him. Jesus told Joseph, Joseph not to join any of the churches, for they were all wrong. And they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And that is uh, in written. That was written by Joseph Smith in History 119. Yeah, uh, let's unpack this. Um, basically, it's the same thing that happened with Charles Days Russell. You know, Charles Days Russell realized too that you know. All the churches that existed in, in his time were wrong. You know? Charles C. Russell, originally Charles C. Russell tried to work with the ch existing churches, with the existing congregations, but then he realized that it was a you know a waste of time. And he went ahead and founded the Bible students and, and, and decided to just restore, you know, the first century congregation through the Bible students through a new fresh movement dedicated to restoration. And then he based himself, of course, on, on the King James Bible. Okay. I mean, Bible students. I mean, Charles C. Russell was very much a, a, a Bible man, a Bible, you know, which he, Charles C. Russell would completely disagree with me. I mean, Charles C. Russell, Charles C. Russell would, would say, I, I am the Antichrist, right? I am the Antichrist. And he would completely, you know, deny that the Book of Mormon is, has any sort of canonical authority, right? Um, However, I continue to like his systematic theology. Like I said, studies in the scriptures is a great, um, a great uh, um, um, expose. It's a great uh, example of systematic restorationist theology. Charles says Russell studies in the scriptures, you know, and that is a very good thing. It's all based on the Bible. It's all Bible. It's Bible, Bible, Bible. But the 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 um, the sort of the spirit of it and the and the and the, and the intellectual um, uh, construct is restorationist, right? So it's it's very good. So yeah, um, and I will read. You know, I, I I read. I've only read the first two. I need to read the rest, but I don't have time. But because it's a lot. I mean, it's very. You know, you have to really focus and have other things to read. But yeah. Um, hmm. As God had done with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and other prophets, I already said what I think about those people. 
uh, he called Joseph Smith to be a prophet through whom he to whom through whom the complete gospel was restored. And by restored, I mean, of course, eventually Joseph Smith was told where the Book of Mormon was. He unearthed it, um, translated it, etc. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, this is what Joseph Smith says about said about his experience of meeting uh, God and Jesus Christ. Quote, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spoke unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. That's what Joseph Smith said happened when he met uh, God and Jesus, whatever. He said, okay, um, oh, okay, I have to stop this video because it's going on 32 minutes, and then I'm going to, I guess video three will be the end. This is going on three. It's almost done, so I'll be right back.